الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and uh, welcome to our weekly webinar uh, today uh, we have a slightly new topic um, but hopefully you will uh, appreciate the importance of the topic uh, once we go more into it inshallah so the topic is explaining the Islamic worldview or maybe to put it um, uh, more so to understand uh, the Islamic worldview and understanding how to deal with conversations when we are giving da'wah. Um, <clears throat> parts of this presentation uh, can be found in uh, a work produced by uh, Ustav uh, Fahad Taslim, uh, no doubt, and he covers the course um, in our recorded sessions as well, uh, dealing with doubts and misconceptions. But hopefully we'll try and add some more context to the discussion. Um, the purpose behind uh, this particular topic is to equip ourselves with the, and I'm using certain words, don't worry too much, hopefully it'll be more clearer later on, uh, epi epistemic psycho-spiritual tools to deal with your or other people's doubts. We do that starting by expounding upon foundations. And this is uh, something very important and hopefully inshallah we'll do a few sessions on this later on, <laughs> which is how do we deal with doubts? When you're giving dawah to someone and someone comes to you and raises a concern or someone raises a doubt to you, how are you going to respond to that person? Now, for those who had gone through the uh, first recorded course on Gorap, you'll remember the conversation about how important it is that you take the conversation back to understanding the Islamic worldview. Because, for example, the example that's, I think, given in the video is as well, if you are trying to explain to someone, for example, the, glass, uh, the grass is green, and yet the, the lenses that they are wearing um, is red tinted lenses, all they will see is red. No matter how you try and explain it, the only thing they will see is red. Now, for them to really understand your perspective is when it would only happen if they were to remove their red tinted glasses and look the same way you are looking at the grass. <laughs> and in a similar way, uh, this is a similar kind of thing of how do we deal with uh, doubts and misconceptions when someone, it could be someone who's having doubts amongst themselves or whether it's to do with uh, someone raising a doubt or misconception about Islam. And so when we are talking about the worldview, what we are trying to say is that there is a particular lens through which you see reality, right? Our worldview world will impact our positions on various different issues, whether it's social issues, psychological issues, economical issues, political issues, ethical issues, and so on. And so even the person who's coming to you with a doubt or misconception, it's important to remember that they're also coming with a particular worldview. And it's important to try and understand that worldview in order to hopefully give a better representation of the Muslim faith. Now, this is a video. I don't know how many of you have come across it. It was only, I think, released a couple of days ago, but it's to do with the recent issue with the LGBTQ rights uh, during the Qatar uh, World Cup. And I think it's a really good video, a short video. Hopefully, I think it's about two minutes. Hopefully, you will understand the perspective of when we say worldview uh, through this conversation. So I'll play the, the video for you. I'm hoping you should be able to hear it. Uh, can someone confirm whether they can hear the the voice? If you could just maybe write on your comment on the chat box whether you can hear the voice or not. Okay, so let me try and do something. Why is Qatar struggling so much with LGBT people? Is a simple bigotry? Can't they be more open-minded and be more accepting of all self-identity? Okay, can you just confirm whether you can hear or not? You can. Okay, excellent. I'll just play it again then. 
Why is Qatar struggling so much with LGBT people? Is a simple bigotry? Can't they be more open-minded and be more accepting of all self-identities? Well, it's because of the moral framework of Islam and LGBT that are diametrically opposed. You see, LGBT is a result of Western individual liberalism. It's built fundamentally upon the revolutionary idea that one has sovereignty over their own bodies. You are free to do whatever you want with it. As a result, the idea of goodness is a utilitarian one where fostering one's own pleasure and limiting the undermining of other people's pleasure is the ultimate virtue. And because morality is subjective, one's own feelings inside are of the up most important. Hence, we have people identifying with their own feelings and bodily urges. Hence, I feel like a female, therefore I am a female. I'm attracted to men, therefore I identify as a homosexual. In Islam, on the other hand, one doesn't have sovereignty over their own bodies, for humans were created deliberately by God to fulfill a noble and spiritual purpose. And that purpose is in serving God, who is the ultimate form of good. In this moral framework, work in this paradigm, Allah created the male and the female with reproductive and social roles, and thus fulfilling those purposes is honouring God. There is no concept of my body, my choice, for the choice has already been made. It was destined for you. It is, for example, only in a heterosexual marriage where gender uh, differences are enforced, where men are more dominant and women have ideals of beauty and gentility, that we see a metaphysical wholeness in marriage. Sex outside those purposes loses all meaning and legitimacy. For well, remember, the purpose of sex isn't individualistic pleasure, but to fulfill a higher and transcendent good. I hope you can see that Qatar can't simply make a few small amendments to their laws and wave a rainbow flag and accept homosexuality and trans people because their whole teleology of humanity in general is diametrically opposed to what we're familiar with in the Western world. And all the individualistic liberalism has become the de facto lingua franca of morality. We do need to understand the difficulty or even the futility of, well, colonizing foreign people with our ideas of morality. We might think that we're right and they're wrong, but remember, they are thinking the exact same thing. Thanks for watching. Right, so what you just heard there, was a, a good way to try and understand worldview because in the short presentation, the person didn't tackle the specific point regarding uh, homosexuality and Islam, but rather presented two different worldviews. If you appreciate the worldview, then you can appreciate where the per person is coming from. And that's why even when you look at Islamically, whether Islam can be termed as a religion is debatable uh, because of the restrictive nature of the way religion is understood in other, uh, other uh, groups and organizations. Uh, a more closer and more approximate term to uh, the, the one that's used in the Quran, which is a, a deen, in the deen in the Allah islam is worldview because it... Uh, understand the worldview will allow us to be more clearly or more clearly understand what is Islam. So what is a worldview? A worldview is a framework of ideas and beliefs that informs one's interpretation of the world that they live in. Now, this framework obviously rests upon certain crucial existential questions. For example, questions about the person's existence, questions like, where did I come from? Why am I here? And what happens when I die? So a worldview is the lens by which a person views reality. <clears throat> and so a worldview is the set of beliefs about fundamental aspects of reality that ground and influence all one's perceiving, thinking, knowing, and doing. It is a study of the world, a view of life, literally a perception of the world, a particular philosophy of life, a concept of the world held by an individual or a group. And it is important to remember here that everyone has a worldview. Even the person who's coming with promoting a particular 
perspective is also coming with a particular worldview. Now, rather than dealing with the specifics of the issue of debate, we have to actually look at the bigger worldview and see whether that worldview is um, consistent and whether uh, it is, uh, does it make sense or not, or whether there are concerns with understanding that particular worldview. And that's why, again, when you go back to the Gorap, uh, Ustad Abdul Rahim Green reminds you that you shouldn't start debating individual topics. Rather, what you should say is, that in order for you to understand my perspective, it's important that you appreciate the fundamentals of our faith. And when we say the fundamentals, in other words, we're trying to say it's important you understand our worldview, where we are coming from. So a person's worldview represents their most fundamental beliefs and also assumptions about the universe that they live in. It reflects how they would answer all the big questions of human existence, fundamental questions about who and what we are, where we came from, why we're here, where, if anywhere, we're headed, the meaning and purpose of life, the nature of the afterlife, and what counts as good life here and now. Now, the reality is very few people think through these important questions and very few people are able to even give some kind of answer to them but a person's worldview will at least incline them towards a certain kind of answer for any of these questions that we've asked and so everyone has a worldview and there is no way to interpret reality without a worldview. In the same way we use language to communicate with one another, likewise, a worldview is the epistemic interpretation that we use in order to understand the reality around us. So what we deem to be morally right or what we deem to be immoral, what we consider to be good or evil, pious or impious, all of this depends upon our worldview. Now, <clears throat> even though in the Quranic context, uh, the ayah of the Quran uh, referring to um, directions uh, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, huwa muwalliha, khayrat, aina ma takunu, allahu jami'a, inna allaha ala kulli shay'in qadir. Now, of course, that has a particular context in in uh, in the revelation uh, and the meaning of the ayah but it's interesting that even here ibn kathir rahimallah when he talks about this ayah that everyone has a direction toward which toward which they face so race to it as in race to good whoever you may be allah will bring forth for judgment altogether indeed allah is over all things competent now ibn kathir rahimallah regarding this ayah he says this talks about the followers of the various religions hence every nation and tribe has its own qibla that they choose while Allah appointed Qibla is what the believers face. And Abu Aliya Abu Ali said, the Jews has a direction to which he faces. The Christian has a direction to which he faces. Allah has guided you, O Muslims, to the Qibla, which is the true Qibla. And this also, then he says, the last verse is similar to what Allah said, to everyone we made a law and a method. So when we're talking about worldviews, worldviews are largely, uh, the worldviews largely determine people's opinions on matters of uh, ethics, politics, <clears throat> whether a person thinks abortion is right or wrong, whether a person thinks euthanasia is right or wrong, whether a person thinks same sex is right or wrong, environmental ethics, all of these things depend on our underlying the worldview a person has. So that's why understanding the person's worldview becomes even much more important. Now, when you're trying to understand the components of worldview, uh, it's important to keep in mind that of, co of course, people have broken them down to various categories of components. Obviously, I'm going to present here eight uh, components, but it's possible for someone to include more categories. So we shouldn't worry about the actual categorization. At least we have a general understanding of when a person talks about worldview, what are they talking about?
And we're here, the thing that we will quickly go through is ontology, which is linked with theology, epistemology, anthropology, teleology, morality and ethics, law, politics, and aesthetics. <laughs> now, if you notice um, in the diagram in front of us, uh, you will see that the shade of the color, <clears throat> the lower you go, uh, becomes a bit more blurrer. So with ontology and epistemology, it's a lot more clear. And later on, you will see the shading becomes less. So as I said, <laughs> ontology and epistemology are the darkest in their shading, whilst aesthetics is the lightest. Now, it, as well as having this hierarchy, starting with uh, ontology and theology at the beginning, it's also to remember that uh, the shading was done on purpose to signify the relative potency or strength of each component of a worldview. So morality and ethics has to do with questions about right and wrong, but also it's linked with what we've already, what we will be discussing in terms of ontology and epistemology. So I know we've used a lot of big words. Let's very quickly go through each one of them. So hopefully we then will have a better understanding of what we mean by uh, worldview. So ontology. So ontology is the study of being and relates to the essence of things. Hence, it has to do with what exists and what does not exist. So when we ask questions like, does the tree outside my window exist? Or does this book exist? We are asking questions that are ontological. Foundational ontological questions would be questions such as, such as do I exist? Or does God exist? And such questions will have ramifications on how we interpret ethics, law, politics, sources of knowledge, etc. Now, even here to give you a, a quick example, um, we have, um, you might have heard of uh, Tommy Robinson, um, uh, a famous uh, far-right individual who's been speaking a lot of negative things about Islam and Muslims. But for him, he found it extremely problematic that within the Muslim faith, and this is something that I think Dawkins alludes to as well, that this idea that the Prophet ﷺ went on a, a creature uh, uh, with wings uh, from uh, Mecca to Jerusalem, right? So for them, this was supposedly so ridiculous that they can't believe in this. But this, you see, if if the, if if a group of people believe in angels, then what's the problem? Uh, if you believe in, for example, other unseen beings like the jinns, then then the problem is not as big. So a person's ontological world makeup will have an impact on the kind of questions or doubts that they have. If they do not believe in any of the unseen things, then surely. Um, their position would be different. Now, Tommy Robinson claims to be a Christian. So he believes in God and he believes in angels. So then what's his problem in believing in a creature with wings, right? So a person's ontological framework has an impact on how they uh, understand things and what they consider to be doubtful. Likewise, theology. So theology, we answer the question, does God exist? And as you know, recently, we've done quite a lot of lectures on this particular topic. So does God exist is yes. We then can speak about theology. So theology is the study of God. Uh, theological topics are related to the nature of God and God's relationship to mankind. How a person understands God will have an effect on how they deal with trauma, how they would navigate deeper aspects of meaning uh, within their lives and other questions of spirituality. So uh, sometimes a lot of people who have the issue with the problem with evil have a, a, a a misconception on the theology or at least on the understanding of God and his nature. And, uh, and therefore, because of that misunderstanding, they now lead to certain misconceptions about how to tackle with uh, um, sin and how to tackle with pain and suffering in this world. 
then we have after ontology and theology and of course this um the, these are critical in understanding some of the other topics later on you have epistemology and epistemology is the study of what constitutes knowledge what is knowledge now to, to put it in a very simple way how do you know what you know how do you know what you know so epistemological questions would deal with things like sources of knowledge, paths to knowledge, the roots and foundation of knowledge. Now, clearly, when it comes to a Muslim's uh, epistemological framework, the Quran and Sunnah become extremely important sources of knowledge. Now, if a person doesn't believe in Quran and Sunnah, let's say someone is objecting to um, for example, again, I'm just giving you a random example, uh, someone getting married to uh, someone who's young, someone who's not re reached puberty. Now, if they're going to object to do it, on what grounds are they going to object to it? We'll go back to also epistemology, because how do you know what you know? right obviously morality will come into as well but how do you know what is right what is wrong how do you interpret things will go back to epistemology as well so that's another important component in understanding the worldview then you have anthropology now of course when you look at anthropology generally speaking uh, in universities and colleges it's talking it's talking about a broad topic of humanity and its culture societies linguistics etc however over here, what we are referring to is the study of the composition of a human being. So this particular definition is closer to the linguistic root of the word. And so anthropological questions deal with what or who is man? Does man have a soul or is man just a composition of material elements? How do we understand consciousness? How does language play a part in what it means to be human? Even like, even like if you're talking about education, right? Uh, obviously, those who spoke, speak about Islamic education would argue that when we are um, providing education, we're not just providing cognitive or intellectual education, but we're also providing education or development of the soul. Now, if someone doesn't believe in the soul, then they won't have that particular worldview when it comes to education. So you can see how anthropology and our understanding of human beings, understanding of consciousness, understanding of the soul have an impact on our worldview as well. Then you have teleology. Uh, teleology is an explanation by reference to some purpose, end, goal, or function. So when we speak about teleology, therefore, we are speaking about purpose. A question like, what is the purpose of the kidneys in the human being is a teleological question. However, from a worldview perspective, we are re referring to deeper questions about man, life, and the universe. So questions like, does the universe have a purpose? What is the meaning of life? And hopefully now you're starting to understand that why it's so important to first speak about these kind of issues, questions about worldview, before talking about the other aspects. Now, because if a person doesn't have an understanding of the meaning of life, doesn't have an understanding of God, doesn't understand that they've been sent in this world for a purpose, then they will have a very different worldview. And then later on, then obviously you have morality and ethics. Uh, and again, these are questions related to right and wrong or good behavior and bad behavior. So is it wrong to marry a nine-year-old? Is abortion good? Is euthanasia Right. Now, these type of inquiries are questions of morality and ethics. But hopefully by now you will understand that without a clear ontology, theology and epistemology and also teleology, your understanding of morality and ethics will be either corrupt or uh, uh, won't be uh, complete and wholesome. And so if your worldview is just about individual rights, as the person Dennis previously had mentioned, that ultimately individual rights and you, you are in control of your body and you can do whatever you want, then for you, 
abortion clearly should be fine because ultimately you are the one who decides everything about what happens to you and your body. But if you then understand from an Islamic worldview that your body is a gift to you by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's the creator and that you, there, there is accountability, then surely these kind of moral questions and ethical questions will go back to our larger worldview. And that's why that's important to understand. Now, unfortunately, what happens is because many of the Muslims do not focus on topics of ontology, theology, epistemology, teleology, sometimes they are confused when it comes to moral and ethical questions, because sometimes they might have had a possibly a Western liberal, a far left kind of understanding of some of these issues. And then without understanding the Islamic worldview, they come to a confused notion of what is right and what is wrong. Then you have <laughs> law and politics. So questions about what we consider to be just and unjust from the basis for law and politics. And uh, he obviously, no doubt, these questions are informed by our moral and ethical stances, which obviously in turn are informed by our ontological, epistemological, anthropological, and teleological positions. And then finally, you have aesthetics as well. What we find beautiful, how we perceive beauty. So it may seem surprising to find aesthetics as a component of worldview. However, what one considers beautiful is indicative of a person's underlying worldview commitments, right? So that's why you can see worldview is critical in understanding or even dealing with issues of doubts and trying to answer certain queries. Now, very quickly, I'm just going to give you a very uh, basic um, understanding of Islamic worldview. There's a lot more that can be said and should be said. I think the Gorap model is a good way to explain the Islamic worldview. But very quickly, I'll go through some basics. The Islam's, Islamic worldview is basically a theistic one, believing in God, an ethical worldview, which obviously is very different to a secular or an atheistic alternative. Our belief, our worldview emanates on this fundamental belief that our life and existence came because of a creator, one, uh, the one and only creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah is therefore uh, to precede all discussions when it comes to nature of the universe, man's relation and so on. So again, when someone's objecting to something about Islam, the conversation actually need to go back to our worldview, which is, first of all, do you even believe that God exists and that God is one and that God requires uh, that, you know, you worship him and you follow what he tells you? Uh, so that conception is important from an Islamic worldview. Also, the Islamic worldview is a comprehensive conception of the universe, our relationship within it and all of this, all our different aspects of our life. How we view nature, again, is understood through our world, worldview of Islam. Now, there are certain worldviews out there which will uh, claim that their own nature is a question imposed in the foundation of any ethical system. So some of these common views deny the existence of any purpose of life. They don't believe that there is a purpose in life or that they don't believe in a divine plan. They don't believe in God. Their, these opinions basically view human beings as evolving animals, that we're just evolving animals. So with that worldview, then then understanding, and this is why uh, people like uh, Richard Dawkins is clearly, uh, ha he has a problem of explaining why, for example, incest is wrong. Because if you don't believe in God, and if you believe in uh, human beings just as evolving animals, and you believe in individual liberty, and you can do whatever you want with yourself, then how are you going to say incest is morally wrong? Uh, also, you have other viewpoints which focus on the spiritual aspect um, and just the spiritual aspect resulting in a renunciation of the world uh, and that somehow torturing one's body is a virtue, right? And you find this among some of the Far Eastern uh, religions. Also, you have a third view that tends to overemphasize the intellectual aspect and looks at 
uh, overlooks that fact that the human beings need divine guidance as well. That it's not just the intellect. Yes, the intellect plays an important role, but you also need, you have the fitra as well, which is gives you the divine guidance. You have other worldviews which are very pe pessimistic when it comes to, for example, understanding sin. And I know previously uh, I, did, I did some pre pre uh, presentations looking at uh, sin and salvation in Islam and Christianity and understanding the Christian worldview will hopefully make you understand why Islam differs with with them on certain crucial aspects, especially regarding sin and salvation. Um, and even that then leads to even questions like, for example, or oh, um, in paradise, will uh, believers be able to have physical pleasures? Because again, with with the Christian worldview, they have a different understanding, and that's why for them, something for a believer wouldn't have a doubt in uh, from an Islamic worldview. They for for themselves would have questions regarding those matters. So the Islamic view or the Islamic worldview sees humans distinct from other beings. Humans are the trustees of God on earth. Now, again, this will lead to questions regarding our responsibility as stewards on this earth. Uh, it leads to questions regarding animal rights. It leads to questions about vegetarianism. All of these things go back to the Islamic worldview. And again, there's more to be said on this, um, you know, um, but some of the key aspects of the Islamic worldview is the belief in God, uh, the belief in prophethood. Again, all of this is, is covered in Gorap, right? The belief in God with, uh, with the letters G and O. Uh, believing in nubuwa or prophethood and also believing in the afterlife or eschatology, things that will happen um, uh, after death, resurrection and so on. All of these things will then lead to a particular worldview. And if you understand it from this perspective, then you will be able to have a clear position on many of the questions which are related to uh, society and uh, questions related to moral and ethics. So that's why when someone comes to you with a doubt, the first thing we need to try and understand is which worldview they are coming from and whether that worldview actually holds up when it goes through further scrutiny and then comparing it with the Islamic worldview. And that's why questions uh, are always go back to the existence of God, the, uh, the belief in Allah, uh, questions go back to revelation that we have the Quran, which is our guide. We believe that the Quran provides us with instructions on how to live a good life. And we also believe in an afterlife where there will be accountability and questioning on how we lived our life. So hopefully, inshallah, that's a very quick summary of what we mean by worldview. There's obvious, as you can see, there's a lot more that can be said, but these are important in order to uh, um, deal with issues related uh, to doubts. And inshallah, that's, that will be um, uh, a presentation that I will do next on how do we deal with doubts um, uh, and um, when someone comes with certain doubtful questions, how do we tackle them? This first part hopefully makes you understand the larger picture, how you take the conversation back to the fundamentals, which is the Islamic worldview. Um, and try to make them appreciate the Islamic worldview so that hopefully they can understand the specific uh, rulings within our faith. Um, inshallah, I will stop there. If you have any questions or queries, uh, inshallah, I can address it now.